It's time for this week's parting shots. The college football season is over. We should be matter of fact about it because there really isn't a positive spin to it. A sport whose primary appeal is unique charm had very little this season. The most apt description of the 2020 season would be uncomfortable. College football got to the title game because, damn it, they were going to get there one way or another. And there was a matchup of big names because the Big Ten made sure its biggest name got to the college football playoff. College football has some semblance of a season simply because it refused to do otherwise. What was the cost, though? It'll be years before we know what the physical effects of COVID-19 will be to players. But right now, one thing we know is that entire sport manipulated its rules and regulations on the fly in the name of money. It's been clear how essential players were to the economy that drives college sports. Rules were rewritten, literally, to get Cash Cow Ohio State on the game's biggest stage. All season, the quiet part was said out loud. After games got started, few pretended to be offended. Now that they're done, we'll see if we can forget the naked emperor we saw all autumn. When James Harden was traded to the Nets, the first thing I thought of was the decision. When LeBron opted for Miami, Cavs owner Dan Gilbert penned a letter to fans, calling it a shameful display of selfishness. And LeBron's departure was a cowardly betrayal by a self-titled former king. And just over a decade later, when James Harden shows up late to camp, prods for a trade, and publicly declares his team isn't good enough, the Rockets post a tribute video while owner Tillman Fertitta wishes him the best of luck, saying he's grateful for the memories. Welcome to the new NBA. The evolution of player power in the league is now complete. The playbook for superstars getting to the team they want is now clear, and owners can't do a thing about it. Harden wielded his leverage like a blunt instrument, and the ripple effect? GMs with superstar players now know every second of every year they're on the clock to build a winner. No amount of patience waiting for a team's development or goodwill or loyalty is enough. So in other words, players are treating teams just as teams have treated players all these years. No patience, no loyalty. You know who that's good for? In a lot of cases, fans. One example, Anthony Davis pushed and pushed to get out of New Orleans, and the Pels, and of course Davis, are infinitely better off because of it. Who's to say that won't happen in Houston? My heart hurts for Rockets fans losing the beard, but now management knows with the next superstar, it's on the clock. There won't be much fuss made about the 50th anniversary of the Baltimore Colts beating the Dallas Cowboys in Super Bowl V this weekend. But in a little known fun fact, and far more important in the grand scheme, was a song that was sent the radio on that exact same day. One that legitimately altered the course of music history. Marvin Gaye's What's Going On turns 50 on January 17th and the backstory behind the Motown classic is as mythical as the record itself. It was quite the departure for Gay, who had grown miserable recording jolly, upbeat love songs. You see, the 60s were defined by fractured race relations, countless assassinations, and a war abroad that his brother returned home to tell him about. Also weighing on him was the death of singing partner and confidant Tammy Terrell. Featured on the song are former Detroit Lions Lem Barney and the late Mel Farr, and in return, those two helped Gay land a tryout with the Lions. And the release of the single was done without the knowledge of Motown head Barry Gordy, who didn't approve of his artist taking such risky creative endeavors. For my lifetime, Miami Heat president Pat Riley once told me that song had the most impact of any record ever. Yet on the eve of a week that has the entire country and especially parts of D.C. on edge, it feels painfully poetic that the same question D.C.'s beloved son once asked a half century earlier still hasn't been answered. No, unlike Dwight Eisenhower, Joe Biden didn't start halfback at Army. Unlike Gerald Ford, he didn't win two national titles as a Michigan offensive lineman. And no, unlike George H.W. Bush, he didn't play first base for Yale in back-to-back -back national championship games. But for Joe Biden, being an athlete as a boy meant everything. His peers ridiculed him because of his stutter. But with a ball in his hands, Biden excelled. And it was on the playing fields that he felt most comfortable and grew into a leader. In his memoir, Promises to Keep, Biden wrote, sports turned out to be my ticket to acceptance and more. Even when I stuttered, I was always the kid who said, give me the ball. As a senior in 1960, Biden led the undefeated Archmere Academy football team in scoring. Here in the season finale, the future president races 45 yards for a touchdown. Now, as president, Biden is expected to reset the White House's relationship with sports which under President Trump has been fraught and highly confrontational. That shift will be a relief to many in the world of sports, from the athletes to the owners to the commissioners who like their leagues to operate outside the maelstrom of electoral politics. 
the hope is that Joe Biden, for whom sports has meant so much, won't use our games to divide us. Thanks for watching ESPN on YouTube. For live streaming sports and premium content, subscribe to ESPN+. Plus.